My name is Cynthia Phillips, and I'm here representing the Europa Lander mission concept. Um, some of my partners in crime from the pre-project uh, Project Science Group are uh, Kevin Hand, Morgan Cable, Amy Hoffman, Kate Kraft, as well as a number of people who are on the Europa Lander pre-project uh, science and engineering teams. So what is Europa Lander? We'll use this. So Europa Lander is a mission, like the title says, to land on the surface of Europa. And one of the reasons why Europa is one of the best places to go, in my opinion, in the solar system is that it perhaps is one of the best places to look for life beyond the Earth. And it's a good place to look for extant life, so life that could be there today. And so the Europa Lander mission concept started with a set of top-level science goals. These included a goal to search for evidence of biosignatures on Europa, to assess the habitability of Europa via in-situ techniques, and to characterize the surface and the subsurface. And as is typical when you have a science definition team, the SDT took those set of goals and turned them into a set of, of objectives. Um, these goals and objectives then become addressed with a focused model payload. And so in this mission concept, we now can expand these, set, these three goals into a number of objectives that are shown around here. And then you can think about what instruments you would need. And so in this case, we really wanted a focused payload that would include instruments that would address more than one of these aspects of the mission simultaneously. And so the model payload has a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, it has a microscope, it has something like a Raman, it has um, context camera or cameras, and it also has a geophone or a seismic package. And so when we combine together the, the, those elements of the science payload, we then have a robust mission concept. And so the basic idea is that this, this is a large mission. Um, it has to launch on an SLS. The uh, cruise from Earth to Jupiter is about five years on an SLS, and that's with a gravity assist, um, either Mars or Earth, depending on the launch date. Um, and then it's about another two years after that before we actually land on the surface of Europa. The carrier stage in this mission concept is a, it's a dumb carrier. So basically all the brains are on the lander itself, you have a large carrier, it's actually larger than the Europa Clipper wingspan, um, but once it drops off its payload in Europa orbit, the carrier flies off into a disposal orbit. The deorbit de descent and landing stage uses a sky crane. Um, this is with a 10 meter tether, and that's because in Europa there is no appreciable atmosphere. So that means that air braking, parachutes, airbags just don't work there. But fortunately, a sky crane turns out to work really well for delivering payload to the surface. And actually, because there's no atmosphere, you are able to land with 100 meter accuracy. There's nothing to blow you downstream. Um, you can just land. You can basically pick a point on the surface and with some help along the way, um, through terrain relative navigation and an onboard LIDAR for hazard avoidance, you're able to land on the surface basically wherever you want to put this. And once you're on the surface, it's a biosignature science mission. So the idea is that we'll excavate to about 10 centimeters below the surface, we'll collect a sample um, using a sampling system, and then analyze it on board the spacecraft with that model payload that I just discussed. And because Europa's surface is in such a high radiation environment, what that means is that this is a short mission. So we just heard about Dragonfly, which is about a two and a half year nominal mission. Uh, here we're talking about 22 days. So it's a short, compressed mission. And as you'll see in a bit, that requires quite a bit of autonomy to perform the mission. Um, but we believe that we're able to, to perform this mission, we're able to complete our science goals robustly, even given that limited time span. And so here's just a nice overview, because it's always easier to visualize something with a picture. So here's the Europa Lander spacecraft coming into Jupiter orbit. And you can see that the spacecraft here, I'll just point with the mouse, um, it's encased in a, in a, in a bio-barrier. Planetary protection is an important concern when we're landing on the surface of Europa, uh, but we have a great team who's been addressing this, and we think that we can do this in a way that, that meets all of the planetary protection requirements. So the spacecraft, again, we're on this very large solar-powered carrier stage that's larger than the, than the wingspan of the Europa Clipper spacecraft, so that's about the size of a basketball field. We're talking a lot of solar panels. Um, we dump the carrier into a disposal orbit, and here comes the um, deorbit descent and landing stage. As the spacecraft is released um, from its, from its biobarrier, it then takes over. And so you can see here, this, this animation shows a slightly, you'll see, you'll see a number of different versions of the spacecraft um, throughout the imagery that I show in this talk. Um, in this one, you'll see that the, that the landing portion looks slightly different. 
Um, that's just because we still have a number of open trades on the engineering side as we proceed. So here's the spacecraft. We are continuing with the um, descent stage. And so we have a series of thrusters that are on the spacecraft itself to basically decelerate it and take it down. Oh, this keeps pausing. There we go. Keep to, to decelerate it and take it down to the surface. Um, once we get close to the surface, we've already chosen a location on the surface to land using imagery from the Europa Clipper spacecraft. Um, and now we're heading for that location using something called terrain relative navigation. That means that we've loaded the highest resolution images we have of the landing site from Europa Clipper, and then images that are taken during landing are matched to that, as well as active hazard avoidance so that we can land on the surface. So you saw those adaptable landing stabilizer legs as it came down. Um, the spacecraft is actually supported by a belly pan that's right in the center. The stabilizers basically help so that if you land on an obstacle that's nominally about half a meter high, um, up to as much as a meter, you're still able to land, you lock the stabilizer legs in place once the belly band touches the surface, and that holds the deck in a nice horizontal position, even if you land on very rough terrain. Once the spacecraft has checked out the surroundings, we then undock the uh, sampling arm. So this device, had in, in this, this version, and again, this is also an open trade, in this version we have a, a bi-blade saw tool which is able to dig up about 10 centimeters below the surface. And 10 centimeters is far enough down where you're below the bulk of the radiation processing. And so what that means is that we can sample more pristine surface material to look for those evidence of biosignatures. Once we've dug that trench, and of course, in real life, digging the trench would take a bit longer, and you have some tailings to deal with. But here, you're basically collecting now a sample from the bottom of that trench. And in this version, we're using a sample acquisition system that's a little bit similar to what we did on Mars Phoenix. Um, and we're looking at multiple different ways of doing that. The sample is then transferred to the spacecraft, and then again, on board the spacecraft, we have that model payload of analysis instruments, including a GCMS, a Raman, a microscope. Um, and again, we also have a, a seismometer, a geophone, as well as context cameras on the surface. And so this would take place semi-autonomously. Um, there is room for ground input, um, but a lot, of the, a lot of what needs to be done needs to be done autonomously by the spacecraft. So here's just some details showing. You can see here that the, um, the, the landing feet here look a little bit more sp half spherical rather than the flat ones previously. So we're looking at a number of different foot designs. Um, perhaps the, um, these here can be deformable so that, again, if you land on rough terrain, you're able to stabilize yourself more carefully. And so when we're thinking about the, si the uh, science surface operations of this mission, we start with Europa Clipper data. And that provides us with a scientifically compelling landing site uh, with a number of these candidates. Um, and so the instruments on Clipper will give us surface composition, morphology, a degree of radiation processing, et cetera. And we'll use that data to help select a site that's scientifically interesting but is also viable from an engineering perspective. We want to make sure we can land there safely. The, uh, because, again, of the, of the primary battery architecture, um, that comes from the fact that radiation damage would probably destroy the spacecraft in approximately a month. So there's no point in bringing more power than you need. So this is a mission where it doesn't make sense to use an RTG, um, using batteries that are sized to be able to survive, to keep your spacecraft alive long enough to do its primary mission, but you basically want to run out of battery power about the time when radiation damage would have killed your spacecraft anyway. Um, and so these are open trades that we're working with the engineering team. Um, but we'll need the lander to be highly automated. We'll need it to be designed for uncertain surface topography and materials. Um, and again, we'll, we'll need a high degree of autonomy for the location of the trench that we choose to take um, and how samples are acquired from that trench and analyzed by the instrumentation. So an exciting bit of progress on the Europa Lander mission concept is that we uh, recently had 14 teams that were selected as part of this IC2 program um, through NASA ROSES. And so those teams are listed here. And you can see that many of these fit into the categories that were listed in the model payload um, there's, with some interesting additions that are listed uh, down here on the right, such as a, um, and so, so basically what this does is it allows us to work with these teams to really help to mature their technology and really help mature not just, this, not just their instrument concept, but to think about how these instrument concepts would work with the whole spacecraft. Because clearly on a spacecraft like this that is, it's small, it's very limited in mass, power, volume, and time, we have to have a payload that works very well together and that's highly integrated. 
So as we think about the path forward for this Europa land emission concept, again, this is not a mission that has been funded yet. We have not yet gone into phase A, but the mission has years of development behind it, and it's really a very mature and exciting mission concept. And so over the next two years, um, we have um, about 50, actually, advanced development activities. And so these include lab work on cryogenic ice properties, improvements of the sampling system, studies of surface autonomy, better development of battery design, um, more study of planetary protection constraints, um, a detailed look at contamination control. How can we make sure that the thrusters on the rocket don't actually um, don't, don't actually disturb the surface to a too great a degree for us to be able to sample pristine material. And so the teams on IC2, they'll be working with the Europa Lander pre-project for the next two years. Uh, yesterday, we had a very successful workshop called the Instrumentation for the Institute in Exploration of Europa and Ocean Worlds. Uh, we had about 150 participants. Um, thank you to those of you who came. Again, we apologize for the very small room, but that really shows the excitement about, these, about this future exploration. And we're likely going to be hosting a full uh, multi-day workshop early next year. We also need to be thinking about the decadal survey. Um, for those of us who think about in-situ exploration of ocean icy worlds, Europa Lander needs to be a priority. Uh, even with the exciting selection of Dragonfly, that's a very different end member from the surface of a place like Europa. Um, and so it'll be very interesting to see what Dragonfly gives us, but it would be really even more interesting if we could compare and contrast what we see on the surface of a world like Titan with what we see on the surface of a world like Europa. And I'll end there. Thank you.